Professor Robinson is a famous economist, an institutional economist, whose work has been distinguished as, at many occasions and published it in, in the best journals. He is actually about to achieve what we call the publication Grand Slam, with at least one publication in each top five, with the first coming one in Econometrica. Um, what I would like uh, to share with you in this introductory speech is some peculiarities of um, uh, his way of being an economist that occurred to me. Um, when, first contacting, when we first contacted him last year to, in, to invite him as a keynote speaker, his first answer was great and simple. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm honored. Uh, I'm, I would be very happy to do it. Okay. Two months later, he came back with the following much intriguing request. Is it possible to organize, to organize a session at your conference on why Switzerland is so different? I just read a history of Montenegro, not that far away, but how come Switzerland didn't end up like that? Or Albania? After all, it was almost a stateless uh, society until the 19th century. I know that this may not be in the domain of economists, but wouldn't it be interesting to maybe get some historians or anthropologists or sociologists or whoever may have written something interesting uh, on these subjects and to suggest ideas. I would be happy to take part uh, uh, on a panel. I find it fascinating. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's pretty relevant for policy making. There is no panel session on why Switzerland is Switzerland today in the, in the program, but uh, however, Professor Robinson managed to identify, I think, five uh, Swiss historians whose work uh, will be relevant. We, ha we have all written about the Swiss distinctiveness historically, but unfortunately, it didn't work out. But what we have here, I think, it's a clear demonstration of an economist who really tries on the interdisciplinary side, who really tries to fight the academic insularity in the prospect of creating new ways of advancing, of advancing knowledge, global knowledge, uh, beyond the economic discipline. Global knowledge for a, wide range of, of, for a wide range of countries. Professor Robinson he has been conducting research in Bolivia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, Sierra Leone, Cuba Kingdom of Central Africa, uh, in Central Africa, Haiti, in Antioquia, in Bog uh, it's a department of Colombia, uh, where actually he has also talked for many years during the summer at the University of the Andes in Bogota where he gave a, a course entitled The Peculiarities of uh, Colombian Economic History. So, no uniform policy uh, code for all nations. Professor Robinson alleges that there will not be a single prescription deemed appropriate for all economies. Cultural and societal contexts differ, as do histories. And while there are broad policy uh, principles we will need to pay heed to, he recognizes that there are space for diversity and context specificity of nations. In addition to his long list of amazing publications, uh, he also wrote or edited a long list of books aimed at reaching out a greater audience, such as Africa's Development in Historical Perspective, uh, the role of elites in economic development, and obviously why nations fail, uh, translated into no less than 31 languages. So, global knowledge uh, with global geographical scope and global diffusion. This could be a wonderful definition of what we could call an inclusive economist. So, Professor Robinson, you are a great, talented, uh, creative, energetic person, no doubts at all. But we also have to think about the institutions that might have channeled your energy towards inclusiveness. So my question may be a little bit provocative, but you don't need to answer to it. Do inclusive economists always end up in a school of public policy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here with us, Professor Robinson. Thank you, the floor is yours. Okay. Oh gosh. Let's see if this works. No, it doesn't. What do I press? 
Uh, which one is it? Okay, great. Yeah. All right. No, this doesn't work. Oh, there you go. Okay. Terribly incompetent. Oh, okay, I have to do this. All right. Oh, gosh, okay, there's a lag. There's a lag. I should know that being at Chicago, you know, as Mil Milton Friedman once famously said, there's long and variable lags. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for that very generous... Uh, Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure I know how to answer the, the question you posed, but let me, let me work on it. And you know, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's true, there you, there you are, you see. Uh, it's true that you'll find out why I'm, interest, I'm so interested in Switzerland. It's true that we did, I did try to organize this session with these historians, and they all refused to show up, you know. So it's not quite clear why that was, whether they're just intrinsically very suspicious of economists and economists' motivation, or whether it's just like they didn't know me from Adam and they had no idea who I was, or whether it's just you're just not their crowd, you know, like they just don't care what you think about their work. And, but it was, very, it was a very dis disappointing experience, I have to tell you. Uh, so, you know, cause, because, because it is very interesting, Switzerland, and, uh, and anyway, okay, so I've got, I have absolutely deep, deep to say about Switzerland. Gosh, what is going wrong, isn't it? Uh, okay, someone's going to have to have a rush through this. Okay, no, I think this is easily remarked. This is easily solved. Okay. All right, so after all these teething problems, let's hope we get back on track. All right, so what I was going to do today was talk about some new work with Daron, uh, uh, Daron Ashimolu, uh, uh, and you know, it's a paper called The Emergence of Weak, Despotic, and Inclusive States. So this is on my webpage, it's on Daron's webpage as well. So it's, it's a sort of work in progress, but I think we sorted out all the problems with the algebra so, so, and the typos. So, so, so if you're interested in what I have to talk about today, and I'm going to skate over some of the technical things, then you know you can look at the working paper on the webpage. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that in our minds, you know, we, we, it's a sort of, it's a, it's, a, it's a sequel to why nations fail in the sense that it's trying to resolve a lot of the issues that we saw as being problematic with why nations fail, that we sort of buried, you know, because we were trying to do something accessible and simple and sort of parsimonious. Uh, so it's trying to tackle some of the underlying conceptual questions, particularly about the dynamics of political institutions, as you'll see. Okay? So I don't want to insult your intelligence by talking too much about why nations fail, uh, but if you remember, gosh, maybe there's like, yeah, okay. So, so just, you know, just to kind of give you a sense of where this is coming from, if you thought about, you know, summing up the argument of why nations fail with a matrix, you know, which isn't in, this was actually Elhanan Helpman suggested this to us, but it didn't, didn't make it into the book because it was regarded as far too nerdy by the, by the publishers, you know, we sort of emphasized a lot that underdevelopment is caused by these extractive economic institutions, they're underpinned by these extractive political institutions, and that's what, that's where poor countries are, they're in this cell of the matrix. Whereas rich countries, you know, they have inclusive economic institutions, they're underpinned by these inclusive political institutions. And then we emphasize that the off-diagonals here where you have a combination of both, that's sort of unstable. You can't really stay with inclusive, extractive, extractive, inclusive. Okay? So then, you know, the question is, you know, so we focus a lot on sort of saying, you know, once you're in this bin, it's very hard to get out of it. Once you're in that bin, you know, it's very hard to get out of it as well, and that's, pretty, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty comforting thought for those of us living in the United States at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, underlying this is some story about the dynamics of political transition. So the emphasis is very much on the politics, you know, getting the politics right. Once you get the politics right, you get the economics right. So if you're in the extractive, extractive bin, then some sense, you know, what you need is some transformation of your political institutions in order to become inclusive. So how is it you get from extractive 
political institutions to inclusive political institutions. So I think it's fair to say, you know, we have some examples in the book, but I think it's fair to say it's very under consent. I think I'm going to give up on this. Okay. So I think it's, very, it's fair to say that it's very under conceptualized in the book, these dynamics of political institutions and one of the mechanisms that allow you to make a transition from extractive political institutions to inclusive political institutions. And indeed, what are the dynamics of a society like Switzerland you know, that ended up so inclusive economically and politically? How did it get there exactly? Okay. So, so, and to think about that, it's important to recognize that there's sort of two dimensions of political institutions that we emphasize a lot in the book. One is sort of how power is distributed in society, okay, narrowly or broadly. And the other is the nature of your state. The extent to which, what, to what extent you have this effective centralized state institutions. So you could draw another matrix. I'm very nervous now about pushing this thing. I wonder if I should just start doing that. Okay. So, so you know, you could draw another matrix and sort of said, okay, you know, that in the previous matrix I talk about extractive political institutions and inclusive political institutions, but in some sense there's two dimensions projected into one there. So if I pull that apart, there's, you know, there's two dimensions. There's this kind of state institutions that are weak or strong, let me say. You know, so the state has capacity or it doesn't have capacity. And in the book, we even talk about examples which don't have centralized states. And you, know, you mentioned Montenegro, for example, or even Switzerland. You, know, you could say Switzerland had a lot of governance at a local level, but it didn't have an effective federal state until halfway through the 19th century. Okay? So, so one issue is just to do with the kind of construction of centralized state authority. And another one, you could say, is to do with the capacity of uh, that state organization. And the other thing is the distribution of power in society. So we use this word pluralistic in the book, which was possibly a mistake. But anyway, so we're stuck with it now. So, so, so in some sense, inclusive political institutions you have both of these things. But then there's all of these other cases. You know, so how do I think about these other cases? And how do I think about how these things work in tandem? You know, how does the capacity of the state or the strength of the state to do stuff, raise taxes, regulate society, establish a monopoly of violence, how does that interact with the distribution of power in society? Are those two things sort of complementary or are they you know, they are in contradiction to each other. And so I think the way to think about what I'm going to talk about today is I'm, we're trying to develop, I'm going to present a very specific model of the interaction between these two dimensions, okay? Conceptualized in a particular way to try to think about the circumstances under which a society which doesn't have inclusive political institutions sort of, how does it acquire them? Okay. Now, of course, there's a lot of wisdom in social science on these topics, you know, because you know, at some level you could sort of think, well, this dimension is about state building, no creation of state capacity, and this dimension is about you know, democratization. Or, you know, the ha you know, so so there's, a, there's an awful lot of literature on this. And you know, let me just focus, and you'll see why, I think, on uh, one aspect of this, which is, say, the capacity of the state or centralization of the state. Okay? You know, again, I mentioned there's lots of different ways of thinking about that. You could think about the monopoly of violence. You could think about you know, uh, the bureaucratic organization of the state. So you know, the work of Peter Evans you know, for many years uh, and uh, uh, many sociologists, Peter, uh, Peter and Jim Rauch did this empirical work. Uh, you know, fiscal capacity, which is, and, you know, which is very much the emphasis of uh, Besley and Pearson's work. Um, you know, so there's many dimensions to this. You know, I'm not going to have a model of the many dimensions, but just, just to think about you know, how, what does that mean to talk about the capacity of the state. And what creates variation in this capacity? What are the explanations of the variation in state capacity? Well, what I want to kind of emphasize and play off as, as I get into the talk is also this. Well, there's lots of dimensions, but the theories of, you know, which explain variation in state capacity in the world are very structural. Okay? So remember, the agenda here is trying to think about how do you get from these extracted political institutions to inclusive political institutions. And one aspect of that is developing state institutions. So there's a literature on this, and it talks about all sorts of things. You know, population density and interstate warfare and trade potential. You know, so why is state capacity so weak in Africa? Well, one argument due to Jeffrey Herbst is that population density is very low in Africa, so historically it really wasn't worth establishing territorial rule of different parts of Africa. People were scarce, not land. So you tried to control people, and there was slavery, but you didn't have territorial states. And 
etc. Okay, so there's many different types of, re you know, there's an ideological, religious argument. Phil Gorski, who's a sociologist at Yale, has worked on this kind of aspect of state history, state development. There's lots of economic arguments about the kind of co-evolution of modern states and capitalism, you could say. And then there's the political work that, you know, Besley and Pearson have proposed, like different political economy explanations for the development of state capacity. But I'd like to make two observations about all of this literature. And one is... You know, which is going to be the sort of jumping off point for a long kind of case study and then the model. And you know, one is all of this work, most of this work kind of conceptualizes state building as this sort of elite top down project. You know, so in Besley and Pearson's model, there's somebody in power, you know, they're trying to solve this optimization problem, and there's some contender who might displace them from power, and that creates a kind of politics of the trade off between, you know, developing a state or not developing a state. You know, most of this work is very much in that, you know, in that mode. You know, so most of this work on, say, the, the Tilly's work on the role of interstate warfare on state capacity is, you know, you're worried about being invaded by the French, if you're the English, maybe the Swiss as well, you know, so that, uh, so that, you know, and then, you know, so you need to have a fiscal system to pay the army and make weapons, and if you don't, you just get destroyed, so then that creates a huge impulse towards, for the elite, you know, the English Tudors or the Stuarts or whoever it was in the English case, or Louis XIV, that gives a huge impulse towards building fiscal institutions, all right, because otherwise you just get destroyed. All right? So again, it's a sort of elite down top uh, focus. The other focus is sort of these big structural differences. Okay? So, so, but I guess the starting point for Daron and I, when we started thinking about, we started writing down examples of countries that developed inclusive political institutions and inclusive economic institutions, but particularly just talking about the politics. I'm not going to say anything else much about economics after that last sentence. Sorry, I know you're economists, but it could have been much worse. I could have been sitting here with a bunch of Swiss historians. You know, think about the, think about the counterfactual. <laughs> you know, thinking about the development of these political institutions, you know, think, and starting to write down, you know, leaving aside the Swiss case, which you're probably thinking like is sort of ludicrously anomalous, you know, but actually I don't think it is. And even if you take a country like my own country, you know, England, and think about the history of state institutions, you see that there was an immense involvement by society, what you might call society. Okay? I mean, it's kind of interesting in the sense that most British historians would, you know, the, what's the origin of the modern state in Britain? It's the 1530s, the so-called Tudor revolution of government. Who, who was the king of England in the 1530s? Henry VIII. Okay? Anyone, any of you who know anything about Henry VIII know that his mind was not focused on state building. Okay? <laughs> So what the heck was going on there? You know, it wasn't just elites solving an optimization problem you know, in Hampton Court Palace. It was massive involvement of society, too, in demanding institutional change, in pushing for differences in state institutions. So, 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 so first of all, you have to think about sort of society, not just elites. So society doesn't really enter into any of these kind of grand theories of it's about elites, you know, it's about elites in Africa trying to decide should they bureaucratize the state or, you know. So, so first of all, let's think, I want to, we want to think about society. We just started writing down examples and then we just thought about, you know, you can't think about the Swiss case, but it's not just the Swiss case, all right? So, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, if you start thinking about the variation in the world also, you know, and this is why I was interested in Switzerland and Montenegro, here's two places which, if you look at them historically, look extremely similar economically. They're landlocked. They have, you know, mountains. There's clans. There's feuding. There's cows, you know. There's, sure, there's trade opportunity, you know, but what, there's lots of warfare. You know, the, the, the Montenegrins were fending off the Ottomans. The Swiss were fending off the Holy Roman, you know. So there's all, the, like, how the heck did those places end up so different? You know, where's the big structural difference that explains where Montenegro and Albania ended up and where Switzerland ended up? And I don't think that's, you know, there's, there's many, 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 many examples. Think about Central America, the difference between Costa Rica or Guatemala or Honduras, you know, or Africa. Or so, 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 so what I'm going to do to start with, so I think there's, so that's, so that's sort of two kind of things I want to play with. So one is, Where's the society in the development of these, you know, so, so, you know, so, so, you know, all our work about democracy, for example, is all about democracies being demanded from society. That's coming from society. That's not coming from some elite 
democracy-driven process. Elites reluctantly conceded democracy. Okay, so if you know some of our earlier work, this won't be terribly surprising that we think like this. But, but anyway, you'll see how it works in this context. So that's the first thing. Let's bring society into this process. And let's also try to kind of think about, well, do you really need these big structural factors to explain very different outcomes? Okay, so here's the agenda. I'm going to start with a crazy case study, and I'll see how far I can get away with it. You know, I'll have to judge from the mood of the room how successful it is. And so, so and that's going to be from Greece, from classical Greece. And it's going to be an example of a bunch of societies that look very similar historically and end up with extremely different state-society relations. And then I'm going to write down a model to try to capture this interaction between the state and society and show that that model has, very different, has multiple steady-state equilibria with very different state-society relations. So you can get very different outcomes and dynamics from very small differences in initial uh, conditions. And then I'll try to bring it back together again. But the way you should think about this is, you know, I drew that little diagram with that matrix with, um, when I get to the model, the way you should think about the model is, you know, I wrote this matrix down of the distribution of power and the strength of the state. What I'm going to try to do in the model is I'm basically going to write down a model and, you, and I'm going to turn this into a kind of phase space in some sense. And I'm going to try to write down, sort of derive the vector field so we can say something about what the dynamics look like in that figure. So that's kind of the, the, te the more technical, nerdy version of the agenda. All right. So, okay. So in here, this is what it looks like. I can't, I, of course, I, was, I got the matrix around the wrong way, right? So anyway. So, so, and in particular, I'm going, I'm going to, I don't know if this is very helpful to have this now. Maybe it isn't. So let me talk about the example. Okay, so, so here's the example. It'll be, make more sense when, you, when I talk about the model. So, 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 so here's the example. So if you go back to the Iliad, gosh, now we're really on thin ice, okay? If you read the Iliad, there's a famous bit called the Catalog of Ships, where all the Greeks mass you know, ready to invade Troy, to sail to Troy and start besieging it. And, you know... Uh, Homer goes through listing different places. Athens, you know, uh, Athens, a strong built city of Athens, Mycenae, you know, uh, Agamemnon, uh, Menelaus, the king of Sparta, and a bunch of places, you know, so he lists Sparta here, and a bunch of places. You know, where are these places? Well, they were down here. Here's Athens, here's Sparta, a bunch of places called it, the cities in the Mani, what's called the Mani Peninsula here. So here's a bunch of places. You know, in Greece, they had very similar technology. You know, they had the same agricultural technology, they had the same military technology, they grew the same crops, you know, they spoke the same language, they had the same gods, you know, living on Mount Olympus. But they all end up, hundreds of years later, with very dramatic uh, state society relations. In fact, Athens, of course, we know, developed one of the world's most famous democracies. But I'm going to emphasize a lot it didn't just develop a democracy, it developed an immensely capable state. Okay? So it wasn't just a story about building democracy, it was a story about building a very effective state. What did Sparta do? Well, you know, that's going to be, remember my title was weak, despotic, and inclusive states. So that's going to be an example of an inclusive state. All right? What about Sparta? Sparta looked very similar to start with, as many points of comparison. It ended up with a very despotic state. And what about the Mani? that's going to be a despotic state. Well, they never built a state at all. Okay, the Mani, by the time it's sort of observed historically, you know, uh, looks like Montenegro or Albania. Okay, so it's without centralized state authority, a kind of feuding society based on clans, very violent, very anarchic, uh, etc. Okay, so that's a weak state. So, so you get this, you get these places, that are historically, they're all very close to each other. You know, they start by looking very similar, they end up looking very different. Okay, so how, how, can you, how can you think about that? Right? So my first example, when do I shut up? That's what you should clarify when I shut up. Huh? In 30 minutes. In 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. So maybe, maybe rather than talk about that. <laughs> that's Spartan money. I'll talk, I, I gave you the picture. That's money. That's, the money. that's what the money peninsula looks, looks like today. Okay, so, so I would, if I have time, I'll talk about the... You're economists, you want to get to the model, right? So if I have time, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back and talk about the differences, right? But that, that, that's just to convince you that evidence exists. 
you know, uh, that, 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 that what happened in Athens is, you know, the emergence of a strong state and a kind of strong society, I'm calling it now. Okay, so it wasn't just that the Athenians, you know, had democracy. They also, you know, mass public participation in institutions, in courts, you know, uh, in the executive. But they also built a very effective state. You know, if you read Aristotle's Constitution of the Athenians, he lists all the different public functionaries they had, magistrates and people checking the coinage and guarding the port and all of this, right? So they had a state, they had a, and they taxed rich people. How about that, okay? So Sparta looks very similar to start with, but ends up with a state that was probably less strong. It was less good at providing public goods. It didn't have coinage, for example. Uh, but of course, you know, it had some effective state, uh, but it was a state that was, behaved very despotically with respect to majority of society. Okay? The interesting thing about Athens is that even though Athens had slaves, there were laws that were protected slaves. There was a famous hubris law, Solon, which made it, you know, it was a crime to act hubristically even towards slaves. Okay? So, so the legal system, there was a kind of rule of law which also, to some extent, protected slaves, not that it was nice to be a slave, okay? So, 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 but, but, but compared to the, how the helots were treated in Sparta, every year in Sparta, you know, they would declare, you know, it was open season to murder helots, you know, just to remind the helots, you know, how they were under the thumb of the Spartiates, okay? So there's a big difference. So that's a state I'm going to call despotic. You know, you could think about this in terms of James Scott's, James Scott's talks of, you know, that society is kind of Prostrate, you know. So, so yeah, there's a pretty state, a strong state, and the state was strong in some dimensions, militar militaristically, for example, but it was very despotic with respect to society. And society was kind of, you know, really under the thumb of the state, which was extremely different from Athens. As I said, you know, in the Mani Peninsula, the Maniates, state formation never seemed to get off the ground. So, how could I think about that? Well, think of a following model, all right? So, there's two groups. There's the usual Asimoglu Robinson stuff. There's the elites and there's society. So I'm going to think of the elites as there's lots of ways you could do this, but, but let me just try to show you the simplest version of this. The elites are going to be synonymous with the state, and there's going to be a game between two. It's going to be an infinite horizon, but there's, I'm going to just focus on the myopic case, and I'm going to tell you what happens when you have forward looking behavior. Uh, there's, it's a sort of non-overlapping generations. So, so there's going to be no kind of forward-looking behavior in the model I'm going to tell you about. And there's two state variables, X and S. So think about X and S as being the strength of society and the strength of the state. Okay? And X and S are going to be costly to accumulate, so there's going to be dynamics of X and S. And they, X and S are useful in two ways. They, they're useful for producing income, producing surplus, so they affect productivity. But they're also useful for conflict. Okay? So I didn't get time to talk about this, but if I, would, you know, if I was going to talk about the history of the state and society in Athens and Sparta, it's very conflictual. Okay? There's a lot of conflict over institutions, over the control of institutions, the way institutions work. So our view of the world is very conflictual, uh, so that's going to be manifested here. So, so the, you know, this kind of strength, if you like, is going to be useful for producing surplus, but it's also useful for engaging in conflict. Okay? So think of X and S, and think of them as both being in zero, zero and one. Okay? So, so, so everything, the phase space is going to be this kind of unit square, and we're going to have to worry about what's on the, bound, on the boundaries. So, so think about that as being in the, in the square like that. Okay? And to start with, I'm just going to let this be t minus delta, but it turns out to be much more tractable to work in continuous time, so I'm going to take delta, make delta small uh, shortly. All right? So as I said, x and s can be accumulated, so you know, here's the dynamics you can accumulate. Let's use a piece of wonderful modern technology. Uh, you know, so here's xt, there's xt minus 1, there's investment, you know, kind of multiplied by this period length delta, minus depreciation. Okay, so, so there's, you know, you're going to have to make an investment decision, and you know, if, invest, if the investment is greater than delta, so you know, you could, the usual growth model depreciation would be multiplied by the stock, and you can do that too. So this is just a bit easier, uh, kind of technically to work with, but you could do that in, at like a normal kind of growth model. But this, so here's the accumulation equations for society and for the state. Okay, and oh, gosh, all right, let me not do that. So. Remember, there's two, there's two things that X and S are useful for. One is production, right? So uh, there's a think of a production function F, which is increasing in S and X, okay? To start with, I'm just going to close that down. 
and I'm going to look at the dynamics with conflict, just conflict, as an incentive for accumulation, and then I'm going to back up and talk about that case. But once you get the dynamics with accumulation, then 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 you know you can see that you can see how this works. All right. So so just let me shut that down for the minute, and I'll work. I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, and that's all worked out in the paper. So so then. Accumulating, investing in X and S is costly. I'm going to write down some cost functions in a minute. What's the benefit? Well, the benefit is it helps you in this conflict. All right? So what's the conflict technology? So we just, we just have a simple difference form of the, cost, of the contest function here as follows. So it says there's, there's non-overlapping generations. So there's going to be this generation, each generation of elites and citizens that are born, they're going to enter into a, one contest. Okay? And they're going to... They're going to inherit some stock of S or X, and they're going to make an investment decision to accumulate S and X. And the benefit is going to be in terms of their increased probability of winning this contest and taking the surplus, which is just one here. So in particular, if ST is greater than XT plus some sigma, which is drawn from a distribution capital H, then the state wins the contest. Okay? If the inequality is reversed, then society wins the contest. Okay, so this is just going to allow me to write down what's the probability that the state wins the contest. It's just you know, H of S minus X. Okay, so it's just the probability that sigma is lower than this, this, this difference. Okay, so so, so that, that's going to give me a very simple expression for the probability that the state wins this contest and therefore the, incent, the marginal incentives for accumulating state strength and similarly for society, okay? And plus I'm going to assume that this is, this, this is going to be very symmetric. The density is little h. I'm going to make some sort of crucial assumptions about little h in a minute. Okay, so here's the cost function. So there's two, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, there's despotic states, there's weak states, there's inclusive states. So, so there's going to be multiple steady state equilibria. So how am I going to get multiple steady state equilibria? I need some element of non-convexities here. Okay? So, so, so how are we going to model that is the cost of investment. So I is this investment decision to accumulate capacity. That's, there's, a, there's going to be a convex cost function. But if your state variable is below some exogenous threshold, you have to pay this extra cost. Okay, so when your capacity is low, there's there's a kind of extra cost incurred with accumulation. All right, but once you get above this critical level, then the cost is just c. So there's a sort of discontinuous drop in the marginal cost when you get above this threshold. So so you'll see when I talk about the steady state equilibria, you know, I need this wedge in some sense between the marginal costs to get get these kind of asymmetric, despotic, and weak uh, steady state equilibria. Okay? So this is for the civil society. This is for the state. You know, same thing. All right? Uh, okay. There's some technical conditions. <laughs> I don't want to talk about all of this stuff. This is just like in other conditions. This is just a technical condition to rule out the stability of you know, any interior steady states. These are going to be the more interesting kind of conditions on parameters that you, you, we need here. So, so remember, in a steady state equilibria, you know, uh, you're investing at delta. So i is equal to delta. So the reason that delta is in these marginal cost functions is that this is a steady state equilibria. So think of an equilibrium where society has some positive level of strength, okay, in a steady state. They're investing at delta, okay? So x is constant over time. Zero is going to be what's relevant when you're at a corner. Okay, so if you just s equals zero, x equals zero, you're not reproducing anything, so the cost is going to be zero. So this is saying something about if the state is at zero and society is at some interior steady state x, the marginal cost for the state is going to be greater than the marginal cost for society. So you need these, these conditions to get these asymmetric steady states. Maybe if I come back to that later. The other thing which is really important, so the increasing returns are obviously important. The other thing that's important, although this turns out actually much more general than we thought it was, is that H is single peaked. Okay? So, so H is single peaked, so the density is single peaked. So the density is going to give you the marginal incentive to invest in your capacity. Okay? It's going to give you the marginal impact on the probability of winning this contest. Okay? So it's single peaked around zero. All right. Why is that crucial? Well. The probability of winning is just going to be H, if you're the state, is going to be capital H of S minus X. So if S and X are close to each other, that's zero. 
Okay? So if this is single peaked and symmetric around zero, it means that the incentive to invest is going to be the most when we're very close to each other. So you know, if you, any of you people in the audience know the old papers by John Vickers and Chris Harris about racing for a prize. He has, they have two papers in the Review of Economic Studies back in the 1980s. They identified this effect, basically. They called this the, the, the discouragement effect. So when somebody is far ahead of somebody else, then everyone gives up. Okay? So that's what you get here. So this is symmetric around zero. So, so that means if we're very close to each other, the marginal incentives to invest for both of us are the same. But if somebody gets far ahead of the other person, okay, then the marginal incentives are falling, but not just for the person behind, but for the person in front as well. Okay? I may be behind, I can't catch up with you. You know, just I give up. But if I give up, you give up too. Okay? So the nice kind of intuition that they had was that some sense you need when people start pushing each other, then 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 that's when you get kind of a lot of effort. But when somebody gets ahead, everyone gives up. Okay, so that's going to be crucial to thinking about the dynamics here, the kind of dynamics of the interaction between state and society. What's going to drive kind of inclusive political institutions is this H of zero, the fact that we're when we're close to each other, that we push the, the society pushes the state, the state pushes society. But when somebody gets far ahead then society gives up. But if society gives up, the state gives up, and vice versa. All right? So that's, 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 it turns out, if you look in the appendix, this, I mean, I'd never really thought about it before, but this turns out to be, this property turns out to be true in many, many types of standard contest functions. So we just did the thing which seems simpler, but if you just take a standard kind of contest function like Scapurdas and a lot of other people work with, the same discouragement effect is kind of a result. All right, and then, okay, fine. All right, so now you can write down the payoff functions in this static model, very straightforward. So here's the, this is for society. Here's, so here's the probability, their win probability. If they win, they get one, let's say. If they lose, they get nothing. You know, and here's the cost. You know, I need to multiply by this period length here. And here's, this is symmetric. So 1 minus h of x minus s is just h of s minus x. Here's the win probability. This is the expected payoff since there's a 1 multiplied by it for the state minus their cost. All right? So then I can just write down, this is very straightforward, I can just write down the first order conditions. I take the limit so I can write this in continuous time, and I can write down the optimality conditions for the state and for society. All right? So now I've got s dot, I've got the time derivative of, state, of the state strength and society strength here. Okay? So here I have to worry about corners. Okay? So I'm at a corner, the marginal cost is going to be greater than the marginal benefit or the other way around. If I'm at an interior, then you know, I may be below this threshold, so I might have to, I have to worry about this, this, this extra marginal cost here. But then I'm balancing the marginal benefit against the marginal cost. And, and, you know, so, 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 the, and you know, so we may be either we're at a corner or we're kind of decumulating at the maximal rate or you know, we're at a boundary. This, is, this would be the case where we're at the S, where we're a boundary of one. Here, the marginal benefit would be greater than, could be strictly greater than the marginal cost, and you know that's the analogous case here. So, if you just think, you know, for simplicity, if you're kind of in the interior, you know, of this zero one square, you think about the dynamics and think about this, and you know what you have here implicitly is two differential equations in s dot and x dot, and you know what we're interested in sort of doing is. Two exercises. One is to think about what's the steady states of this dynamical system, and one to think about what's the basins of attraction. Okay, so so once we figure out, you know, so what the steady states look like, then we're going to ask, you know, what initial conditions lead you to these particular steady states. So there's no jumping around here in this model. You know, if I give you a starting point like an x and s vector, I can calculate, you know, uh, where you're going to go to. So that's the exercise here. All right. So no, not jumping about. And here's the main result. The main result is there's three locally asymptotically stable steady states. There's one one. Okay. So that's going to be the inclusive. St steady state. That's going to be a case where both the state and society, the marginal cost, the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, but they're at the maximal strength, 1-1. One, one, okay? That's the inclusive society, okay? the inclusive state. There's two asymmetric steady states. There's the Spartan equilibria, where you know, society is prostrate, you know, and the state is at some positive level of, of you know, strength, but strictly less than 1. 
So this is the discouragement effect. So this is the Harris and Vickers uh, discouragement effect. When society gives up, the state gives up, and you converge to a steady state where the state strength is strictly less than one. Okay. On the other hand, you, know, you have something where the state gives up. So this is Sparta. Where the state gives up, this is the Mani, and you know, X is at some interior, some positive, something between gamma and one. Okay. Now, I haven't got time to talk about this, but I think this model nests a lot of ideas you know, within the social science literature. So, for example, the work by Joel Migdal, who's a very distinguished sociologist of the state, he talks about strong society, weak state. You know, so he emphasized a lot that, that state formation is about you know, the state kind of incorporating society or capturing society or socializing society, you know, peasants into Frenchmen. And, you know, but, 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 but so society is very strong, then the state is weak. Okay, well, that's sort of what's true in this, you know, in this steady state here, okay, this steady state number three. But, of course, in our model, you know, the, the state is strongest when society is strongest too, okay? So, so the way we kind of think about this is that this is true here, you know, so the, the, but, but in some sense, so, you know, society dominates the state, and that's, that's not a good thing. When society starts dominating the state, then, yeah, you get this MGTAL, you get this MGTAL type steady state, but that's not the only type of steady state. You can get a much more balanced steady state where society and the state ends up much stronger. Okay? So, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but just to say, I think one thing which is interesting about this is it allows us to sort of think about somehow some of this more traditional literature kind of fits within this rubric. All right. So, you know, let me give you a numerical... This is not a numerical example. I can give you a numerical example. Here's the, what the vector field, the vector field looks like. So, so, you know, so here, you know, there's, a, there's what we call this basin of attraction of where's 1, 1, and then there's these asymmetric things where you converge off to, you know, a position where x is 0, or here when s is 0, Okay. So, so, you know, we have a more schematic, this is the more schematic picture of it. Uh, and the idea here is to sort of say, okay, so you can get these very different steady states, but not because there's enormous structural differences between societies. In fact, very small initial differences can put you on very different dynamic paths, and you can end up with very different types of steady state. Okay, so you can think about variation, you know, without thinking about, you know, albeit going on over long, historical periods, you know, if I thought about the Spartan and Athens and Mani, obviously that's going on over hundreds of years, you know, but, 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 so, you know, I'm not going to have anything to say about that, but, but, but the idea here is to sort of say, you know, you get, a, you can get a lot of variation emerging out of these small different dif initial conditions just through this kind of interaction between the state and the, and the society. Okay, and there's going to be a lot of other interesting stuff here, particularly to do with uh, comparative statics, uh, comparative statics. Okay, so 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 you know. Let me just say for the you know I talked about that. You know we call this the red queen effect, but there's hundreds of. I'm not going to talk about you know. So so there's some interesting technical things about stability here because you're on the boundary. You have to use this. You know you have to use this Lyapunov. Huh, you have to use this. You can't. You know it's hard to linearize. So you have to use this Lyapunov approach to stability, which was kind of fun. So I haven't used that since I was at graduate school. If you read Arrow and Hervix's famous papers about the stability of general equilibrium, they use those, that approach. Uh, but I haven't used it since then. Okay. So, 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 this is, you know, so this is a very myopic uh, model. So in the paper, we look at the, you know, okay, imagine you're forward-looking. So you could think of society and the state as being infinitely lived agents, discounting the future. Think about what does the game look like there. It's very easy to set, set it up as a dynamic programming problem. Uh, but you know the result is the kind of the obvious result, which is imagine you're very patient. Okay, so in some sense, what's what's making these asymmetric, you know, zero, whatever, steady states in equilibrium? Well, it's a fact that there's this kind of wedge in between these marginal cost functions. You know, you're, you're, there's this kind of element of increasing returns. It's kind of trapping x at zero or s equals zero. But if you're forward-looking. Then you know you pay this cost today, but you're then you know you're thinking about this whole stream of payoffs from this. Okay, so so if you're patient enough, that you know the fact that you have to pay this fixed cost today becomes less and less and less and less important, and the vector field converges to this. So if you're patient enough, you just one one is the only steady state. Okay, so so think about all of the you know so the result in the paper is 
all of the results, you know, is just to characterize the critical threshold, the critical value of the discount parameter such that the, the steady states in the, in the infinite horizon model look like the steady states in the myopic model. So there's nothing, there's, you know, there's some grinding involved, but there's nothing very deep involved. Okay, so let me say something about comparative statics, but let me do it in the context of relaxing assumption zero, which is productive use of X and S. So imagine I just take a simple parameterization, which I say, instead of F being one, I let it be a linear function of X and S. Okay, so now X and S kind of add to GDP, if you like. Okay, they add to uh, surplus in the, in the economy. What happens? Well, you know, the first order conditions get a bit more involved. You have to pick up these extra terms now. When I'm deciding to invest, I don't just take into, a, into account you know, the impact on my win probability, I also take into account, you know, what's the impact of my investment on, you know, surplus on the, pri on the size of the prize. So you have to kind of adjust, you know, a little bit, you have to adjust a little bit, you know, the technical assumptions to make sure, you know, everything behaves properly, okay. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, so some of these things are going to be sort of obvious. Uh, but here's the interesting thing, okay. So, so think about, think about, so here's the vector field where, you know, it's just in a particular kind of uh, numerical case. And think about a change in phi x. So phi x is just the parameter which multiplies x in the production function. Okay, so that's, the, that's going to be the marginal effect of an investment in the, the, the strength of society on total surplus in the economy. Okay, so when that changes, what's interesting is that both of these boundaries change. Okay, so, so these boundaries between the basins of attraction of these different steady states depend on the parameters. And when you move these around, so for example, this is just the red curves are a situation where phi x is zero, so that's like what I had before. Then I imagine I just arbitrarily set phi x equal to one and I replot those boundaries. What do they look like? That's the green curve. Okay, so the interesting thing about this is that what does phi x mean? It means you encourage that's going to encourage investment by society. Okay, that's the simple effect. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, depends where you are, all right? So, depends where the initial conditions are, depends, you know, where the dynamics are, okay? So, when you move from red to green, you can see that, you know, by, you can be in a situation in some sense where you are converging to 1-1, one, one, but when you encouraged the investment by civil society, you actually pushed the whole society into the basin of attraction of down here, okay? So you encourage civil society to, to kind of get stronger, but you're already in a situation where you were close to the boundary which would tip you into the steady state where civil society dominated the state. Okay, so that would be a very bad thing to do, okay, because, because that pushes you out of the basin of attraction of 1, 1 and into the basin of attraction of, you know, x star or whatever here on the horizontal axis. So the interesting way to think about comparative statics is how these changes in parameters kind of move the boundaries about, I mean, they change the values of these steady states in kind of obvious ways too, but they move the values of these, they move these boundaries about in ways that can tip you out of 1, you know, and the, the, the intuition is very different depending on which side of this basin of attraction you're in. Okay, the intuition is exactly the opposite if you're up here. So up here, you're in danger of the state dominating society. So then encouraging investment by society is a good thing. Okay, so the policy recommendation, if you, you know, you'd like to call it that, um, is really conditional on where you are, you know, where you are. Are you, on, are you close to this part of this, the basin of attraction of 1, 1, or are you close to the other part? Okay, so that's, that's you know, that's, I think that's, that's the kind of interesting uh, aspect of that. So if you were going to think about building an inclusive society, you'd sort of say, well, that depends on the problem you face. It depends on the initial conditions. It depends on the balance of power between the state and society. So, so you have this... I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a kind of, I guess, you know, Daron, our view of the world is, you know, is like that. You know, stuff is conditional on the context. So another thing we liked about this model is it gives you a very simple way of kind of talking about that. It's okay to say, you know, policy recommendations are conditional on the context. What the heck does that mean? You know, what context? So at least here, there's a very precise way in which you can talk about that, which we kind of think makes sense. 
All right, so how would, I get, how would I talk about this going back to Athens? And Oh, gosh, 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 gosh. Okay, let me not talk about that. Okay, so, so you know, again, the idea here is and there's a long... There's a long discussion of Athens and Sparta and the Mani in the paper, so if you have patience for that, you can, you can read it. But the idea here is to sort of say, these places start very similar and they end up very different. How could that be? Well, here's the model. You know, the model sort of says, okay, you, know, you could end up in these different steady states depending on the initial balance of power between the society and the state. So one of the interesting things about the Athenian case is, is there were elites... But there was also an organized society, and there was a sort of contest between them. You know. And there were moments where that context got resolved institutionally or whatever. So what would be the thinking about that through the model, what would be the difference between Sparta and Athens? Well, it would have to be the case that in Sparta, somehow the elites were more powerful relative to Athens than for, you know, than the citizens. So is that at all plausible? Well, I think it's somewhat plausible. You know, so you know, the, if, you, if you read the scholarly literature you know, by classical historians about, you, know, you can imagine, you, know, <laughs> you could fill this room uh, with, with books on you know, the difference between Athens and Sparta. Uh, and you know, what's the, what's the sort, you know, if you were going to pick the, the, the first principal component you know, or something, uh, you know, the main argument that people like is that Sparta was bigger. You know, Sparta was bigger. You know, there were, you know, the, and moreover, the Spartans came from outside. So Athens had always been kind of where it was. You know, there was a Bronze Age Mycenaean city in Athens on the Parthenon. There wasn't, you know, Sparta was more, they came from outside. So the, the, the Spartiates seem to have migrated from the north. They came, they conquered these people, especially in Messenia. So Sparta was bigger. These were, you know, they were, there were sort of more outsiders and, you know, so, so, you know, maybe that's something to do with the fact that the elites came from outside, you know, and they imposed these uh, extractive institutions on the helots, let me say. What's also interesting is that, you know, Sparta was never a single city like Athens. You know, like, if you've been to Athens and you think about Athenian democracy, everybody was living there, you know, crushed up about, you know, around the Acropolis, and it was sort of easy to be participatory. But Sparta never unified like that. It was sort of a bunch of villages which were separate. And, you know, maybe it's just harder to make the assembly operational, you know, in a context where the population, the kind of core population was more spread out. And it's also true that, you know, the Spartans had kings. They had two kings, you know. They were not really running the place. You know, they were involved in war and religious matters, and, but they had two kings. The Athenians didn't have any kings, you know. So, so the idea is to argue, this is a very superficial parsitive, but they argue that there's this, that, you know, the balance of power between these societies looks like this. You know, what about the many? Well, let me finish, you know, with a very... Very pretentious. I'm going to, you know, stick with a very. I'm going to finish with a very pretentious quote uh, from uh, from the Arestia. Okay. So if you've read the Arestia, the Arestia is just like it's a classic depiction of you know the transition from a feuding society to one based on kind of institutionalized, more institutionalized legal system. You know, there's Agamemnon. He comes back from the Trojan Wars. He's murdered his daughter, you know, to get some good omens. His wife is pissed off about it. So his wife, Clytemnestra, murders him. And then one of his, his other sons murders Clytemnestra. And so this kind of feud starts, and there's all these people, like, egging, egging them on, you know. And what happens is that Orestes ends up, you know, Athena takes him to Athens, and, and she breaks the feud by creating a law court, okay? So, and the law court judges him, you see? I found it here and now. So what's that? It's a sort of transition from a Montenegrin, Albanian, you know, Mani-type society to something with a much more systematized, institutionalized legal system. And in fact, you know, the evidence for that is that when Solon does his big institutional reforms, there's these laws of Draco. You know, nobody really knows what Draco's laws were, except the homicide law. And the homicide law is not really a homicide law. It's a sort of feuding regulation. So it's a kind of, if somebody kills somebody else, it's a sort of, it's a regulation on who gets involved, you know, who can get involved and who can extract revenge and who goes into exile. And so it looks much more like the Albanian canon. You know, the, Albanian had, the Albanians had this traditional legal system, which is actually written down, unlike the Montenegrin one. It was written 
written down in the 1920s. It's a bit of a kind of crazy hodgepodge of stuff. But it looks much more like these sort of regulations for feuding, or like the Pashtun Walia in, in, you know, in, in Afghanistan. So um, that's kind of what Draco's constitution, it seems, looked like. And then there's this transition with Solon. So that society looked a bit like the Mani. You know, where did, why didn't the Mani do that? Well, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> But there's many societies like that, ethnographically observed, persisted into the modern world. So, so just to finish, just to say, you know, uh, here's a way of thinking about these two dimensions. You know, I started by talking about these two dimensions, the capacity of the state or the strength of the state. I'm using a lot of words in a very loose way here. But, you know, and how power is distributed in society, the organization of society. And I talked about how do we get to inclusive political institutions to start with. And I guess here the message is, in why nations fail, the off-diagonals were unstable. But here, the off-diagonals are very stable. Okay? So how do you get to uh, inclusive political institutions? Not by going you know, to the side and then not by you know, the Francis Fukuyama-esque path of you develop state institutions and then society you know, democratizes or whatever. That's, that's not a recipe to inclusive institutions. Inclusive institutions happened, like in Switzerland, I think, because you, you, you know, you, you, the society and state kind of developed together in this sort of symbiotic you know, way, which we call the Red Queen effect. And, and that seemed to be, to us, the lessons of a lot of these historical examples that you know we studied, you know. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. Somebody's going to ask questions. Uh, there's a country out there that used to, until recently, be interested in nation building. Mm -hmm. uh, what you described here was purely autarkic yeah. involvement of institutions, yeah. but you could also have some country coming from the outside and trying uh -huh. to push a society or elite in a, in a particular way. Uh, do you see some scope uh, for that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think Darren and I were often accused. <laughs> we're often, we, you know, we're often accused of focusing too much on these internal dynamics, as if the world didn't exist. You know, but then again, you know, when I read about the history of Switzerland or the history of Montenegro, it seems to be, yeah, there is this interaction. Of course, there's this interaction with the Holy Roman Empire or Napoleon Bonaparte or whatever, or the Ottoman Empire. And but, but there's some kind of internal dynamics of the way that society is organised that seem to be the really big story. You know, of course, it's true that you know, outside powers come and they impose you know, colonial structures you know, or all sorts of things on other parts of the world. You know, but I guess you know, we emphasize a lot that in our other research. I guess here we're going to try to think about that. You know, I didn't talk about it at all, and that's because we haven't really understood how to think about it in terms of just trying to move the parameters about. So I think we want to talk about this internal dynamics. You know, so I might want to talk about what's the difference between you know, Botswana and Rwanda and the Central African Republic and Ghana. Then, yeah, they, were all, they all had European colonialism and outsiders came and they tried to construct different types of state institutions more or less seriously. Or, but then we want to say, well, holding all of that constant, you know, there's these enormous differences in dynamics you know, between Rwanda or Central African Republic, or Botswana, you know, or between Costa Rica, or Guatemala, or Honduras, or Nicaragua. And that's, that's, that's not the Spanish, or the English, or the, it's, it's somehow th something about the internal, no, no, in, those internal dynamics of the society. Of course, that may be, that may be influenced by outsiders. The outsiders may have created you know, all sorts of identities, or stuff like that. But I think we want to do comparative statics with that. But I don't think the focus is going to be very much on these internal 
dynamics. You know, of course, you get the Athenians had an empire. I didn't mention that. You know, and, and there was colonization. They colonized all around the Mediterranean. I didn't mention that. And you know, there was lots of fighting here. You know, the Athenians and the Spartans. They were at neck and neck. You know, they were fighting cats and dogs. But the interesting thing is, you know, if you look at the end of the Peloponnesian Wars, yeah, the Athenians lost the Peloponnesian Wars. The Spartans won. But Athenian institutions kind of bounced back, and there was immense persistence. You know, despite. So, so that's that's the way I'm, we're going to try to tell the story, and yeah. In your vector diagram, this zero zero was not a state no. like Philippio. No, it's not. No. And in your initial um, cross table, that seemed to be a. Equilibrium that you thought like weak state or um, non-inclusive state, non-inclusive society that or econom economy is also a equilibrium. Is this somehow contradicting your initial? No, because because I think that we we kind of like this idea of Migdal that that in in situations which people in social science characterize as ha having a weak state, it's because society doesn't let the state kind of form or doesn't. You know, like many, you know, many ethnographically observed stateless societies, for example, what's really interesting about that literature is that those societies had lots of mechanisms, basically, for stopping anybody accumulating power or authority. Or so, so it wasn't, it wasn't just total. You know, it was so. So society, at some level, was organised. You know, there were social norms, there were all sorts of things. And you know, the interesting case about the Athenian experience, or not just Athenian, but you know, Argos, many other Greek city states, was they managed to sort of internal, they managed to institutionalise social norms like that in a way which sort of allowed the state to take off but control it. You know, like this hubris law, I didn't talk about it, but the ostracism law, I guess, would be the most famous example of that. So they took some social norm which was kind of used for stopping elites, but they managed to create, they managed to institutionalize it in a way which used it as a tool to kind of control elites but allowing the state to form at the same time. So I think that's, that's a trick that's very difficult to that's a thing that's very difficult to solve. You know? so, so, so I think we don't want to say zero, zero. We want to say weak states are weak, like Migdal talked about, because there is this kind of capacity in society to stop states becoming strong, or stop elites con concentrating power. Yeah. Um, what if, if I think about uh, evolution of institutions in Switzerland, very often it's about different groups, you know, not being a homogeneous block of a society. So the society in that sense doesn't really exist. And so it's about finding compromise and finding institutions that check and balance, etc. So you have a sort of heterogeneity that can lead to very different institutions than a very homogeneous block. At the same time, you, need, you might need some homogeneity uh, to actually achieve these sort of you know, decisions to invest or whatever. So it seems to me that there is two blocks. One is this sort of elite block and there is this society thing. And do you have anything to say about how homogeneous or heterogeneous these, you know, societies need to be or, you know, about internal dynamics of these two players in, in, in the model? Uh, no, we're thinking about that. You know, I would say, you know, if I thought about... Uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, you could say Rwanda and Botswana are two of the most homogeneous countries in Africa. You know, they're both countries where, you know, the post-colonial state kind of coincided more or less completely with, you know, previous state institutions. Everyone speaks the same language. Actually, that's less true in Botswana than it is in Rwanda. But they end up with totally opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, so, so I think, so I think, I, 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 we're thinking about that. I, I get that, you know, but I think... <coughs> Yeah, I mean, it could be that Switzerland is... Yeah, I don't know enough about Switzerland. I shouldn't start talking about Switzerland. But, but I, I mean, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. I mean, how to think about this intrinsic here. There's no... I don't even, we don't really have a parameterization of what that means here. Maybe it's differences in your preferences or, you know, how much you... I, 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 we have to think about that. I mean, it's a good question. I guess we've just been... 
kind of assembling case studies or examples to sort of fit, to try to decide how we think about that. Um, but you know, I mean, what's amazing about Switzerland is this immense heterogeneity. Whereas all social scientists would say, you know, that would make this thing, which was a kind of bottom-up construction of a centralized state, almost impossible to conceive of. You know, so, so, I, but I don't know how important that's going to be in our ultimately in the explanation. It's not in the model at the moment. We seem to be okay as long as we start off in a situation where more or less equal forces compete, right? Um, but, but then the question is, if we're not in a situation like that, how can we get to work? Can we get to sort of initial or at least intermediate conditions where then you, you traject to the one-one solution? Yeah. So, so, so what are your thoughts on that? Do we need, do we need wars or freak incidents which wipe out the power of the elite or the society, depending on who has too much power at that particular time? Or could you even have change from within, whereby, you know, one, one part of the elite, which is really strong, wakes up in the morning and says, oh, the future is actually longer than we thought, and, you know, 10 generations from now, we'd actually be better off if we get to one one instead of this 0 0.8 or whatever solution. Yeah. So, so what are your thoughts on how you, how well, you actually get from there? Yeah, so I think I think you want I think you want to think about that you know in terms of these boundaries you know so for example you know in 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 um, you know why nations fail we talk about you know traditional Somali society so that that's a society you know which is like the Montenegrins or something so the society was very strong you know and there was no state I mean there was basically no state in traditional Somali society you know but so but if you think about there's a sort of you know think about like in the last decade or last 15 years Somaliland in the north of Somalia you know basically created a state you know so why did they do you know, they, how did they do why did they do that well one of the reasons is that there's enormous economic incentives for getting their act together because there's lots of cows in Somaliland and when Ramadan happens there's this massive demand for meat in Saudi Arabia. So in the month of Ramadan, they export 5 million cows from Somaliland across, you know, across the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. But you can't export cows unless you get your act together because they have to be health, you need, they need foot and mouth, they need to be foot and mouth free. You need basic public good provision and you have to eliminate piracy. So, so this enormous economic opportunity emerges. So how could you think about that in our diagram? Well, maybe you just that massively increases this fee S, you know, the marginal benefit of state capacity. So it moves it moves the boundary in such a way as the, so the boundary moves and that actually can change the whole dynamics basically of the society. So I think the way we're going to try to talk about that is just like that, you know. So and many, you know, um, many Instances of historical instances of state. I don't, you know, that doesn't seem to be. I'm not sure that's the. I'm not sure about how to think about that in the Greek case. But many instances of state building seem to have this flavour of some new opportunity, kind of economic opportunity emerges. You know, so for, if you read about the history of the Zulu state, you know, so so Shaka Zulu and this centralization of the state in Zululand, what the heck was going on with that? Well, you know, why didn't that happen before? Well, suddenly all these Europeans were on the coast, you know, in Durban and in, Del in like Maputo, you know, in, and, and they were buying ivory, you know, they were buying meat. They, suddenly there were these eco massive economic opportunities of selling stuff to Europeans that had never existed before, and you could make a lot of money controlling this trade or monopolizing it, and so, so then you could think about that as moving the boundary. So, so I, I do think there's you know, there's a lot of, you know, but there's a, that, so that, that's how we're going to talk about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think there's a lot to say about that. Yeah. When you think about China, it's probably uh, correct to assume that the state is pretty strong there. Would you think that China is in the 0 0.9 equilibrium? But at the same time, we see lots of changes uh, yeah. going on. Does China make sense in your model? Well, I, I mean, I think so. I'm not a scholar of China. I guess I would say, you know, my view would be China is a sort of despotic, <laughs> despotic state. Uh, but there's many images of China, you know. So, for example, Lily Tsai, who's a political scientist at MIT, she has a book about, you know, which basically claims that the Communist Party, you know, floats above China. And local society is sort of super self-organizing. And the Communist Party just basically is a charade, you know, that pretends to be running everything. 
And local society, you know, many traditional social structure, clans, temple societies, immense social capital. So her view would be, actually, society is pretty powerful and strong in China, much more so than the view of the, you know, of course, if you go to Beijing, then all the Communist Party, you know, they try to convince you that they're running everything, but that's all nonsense, according to her. And there's a book by Victor Nee called Capitalism from Below, also, which is a very interesting book about how, you know, if you look at the early industrialization in China, again, it's all coming from the bottom. It's not, the Communist Party is not doing anything. They're trying to discourage it like crazy in the 1980s. But it's all coming up from, you know, if you, this, what, you know, what's it place, this place south of Shanghai where Hangzhou is and Jack Ma, you know, these people, these, all, these entrepreneurs, they're all coming up, you know, from society. And it's not, it's about, you know, so it's, there's different images of China. So I, I, I you know, I would say, you know, the way we try to talk about China and why nations fail is that they have this unsustainable model because they have extractive political institutions, but they've made economic institutions much more inclusive. But that's not a stable combination. So I guess that's still my view. Uh, but I do think there's interesting perspectives on China. I guess the problem is China is just so enormous, depending on which bit you look at, the, society, the state society relations may be very different. So maybe there's a lot of heterogeneity within different regions in China. And um, so, so I think, but you know, so I would say, you know, that's still a despotic situation here. And you know, again, that, you know, part of the point here is going to be that's that's a stable, that's not an unstable, you know, that's not a that's and that's not a transitional dynamic towards an inclusive society either. Quite the contrary, you know. So that's going to be part of the point here. But you know, we have a lot of. We did a lot of research to back that up too on the, this modernization, this empirical research we did on the modernization hypothesis. That's very much a part of this way of thinking. Everyone's too shocked. <laughs> So maybe we should 